You could tell they're lonely, you know, they miss their family. They come in assorted neon colors with black imprint. They are guaranteed for life in writing. Do you follow me? Yes, I follow you. Do you receive UPS? What is UPS? Check on delivery. Check on delivery. Hey, JR, come on down here, San Diego. I got a five foot margarita waiting for you right on the beach. There you go. Sound good, huh, JR? Hey, JR. All I want to do is just help people. I'm one of the guys that customize imprinted ballpoint pens for your business. A lot of people are deported, they're depressed, and basically they're, they don't find themselves here. And then go to the next one. People here in Mexico think all people that are deported are criminals. What we're trying to teach people is that, you know what, you're in Mexico here, so you gotta put your feet on the ground, and you gotta try to adapt. And how do you do it? By first, get a job. It's a numbers game, guys. That's all it is. This is a numbers game. You gotta pass all the no's to get to the yes, people. That's all it is. Hi, all. And welcome to this great conversation about the new short documentary, Call Center Blues. I'm Vince Warren. I'm executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And I'm really super excited to be here with the film's director, Gita Ganbir, who is an award-winning director, editor, producer, pretty much everything having to do with <laughs> awesome docs. Um, and uh, with a longstanding dedication and tradition of really shedding lights on critical issues of the day. I'm super excited to be with you, Gita. How are you? Thank you. I think, I mean, I'm actually incredibly honored that you would take the time out of your, you know, your busy life to do this for, you know, to talk to me. So are you kidding? Thank you. This, this film is extraordinary. I mean, it, it's, um, for, I, I don't know if people are used to watching short docs, but I imagine that it is at some point harder to tell a really broad, expansive story in a, in a short format. This film is it's it's magical. It speaks to I think the the quiet piece that's in all of us that we don't always wrestle with when we talk about uh, immigration and migration. It's also been shortlisted for an Academy Award, so. Props to for that. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell, us, tell us a little bit about you know kind of how you made this film and what what you put into it. Sure, sure. No, so um, so this film, uh, I've always been interested in issues uh, that have to do with immigration and identity and you know the topic of of belonging and home. Um, I come from an immigrant background, like so many of us, you know, in this country, and I think. Um, a number of years ago, I read an article in the New York Times about the call centers that were popping up sort of opportunistically in Tijuana, uh, specifically to, to recruit the deportees in that were being you know, kind of dumped unceremoniously across the border um, at such a rate that they were actually uh, able to fill the call centers, that the call center, you know, the fact that there was this 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 kind of opportunistic capitalism that was happening due to um, you know immigration policies and sort of punitive immigration policies and that's always been a trend but um, what made it so, what re what resounded so much with me is the fact that those of us oftentimes you know on the the northern side of the border have no idea who we are talking to when we you know oftentimes we might detect an accent that isn't an American accent or we might understand that you know the person we are speaking to is not in the US but the fact that we might be speaking to someone who is a deportee I think doesn't ever occur to us and that for the folks who are on the other end of the line that this is their sort of their obviously they they may have family um, that they have been separated from friends, family, community, but that they have to spend their days speaking to us as we oftentimes complain about our washing machine or, you know, an insurance policy or something. And what they are going through is not, doesn't ever really dawn on us. And I thought that um, that sort of, uh, that kind of crossroads of, of um, punitive, you know, immigration policies, um, opportunistic capitalism and displacement were made an incredible story. And, and uh, that's how the, the film began. Yeah, it really is an incredible story. And, you know, and weirdly enough, one of the first jobs I had out of, I think after high school, 
uh, was uh, working in a in a call center like that. And I got fired after the first week. So let's just be clear. It is actually not easy work because you literally are listening to people whine and complain and moan about stuff that doesn't work or they're just trying to get off the phone. And you're, you know, so it's there's that. But I think, you know, there's that other piece, which is you're right. You know, when we call help centers for all sorts of different things, um, at least I do, um, somebody will say, hi, this is Chuck or this is Sue. And I'm like listening for the little accent to see, you know, where Chuck and Sue might be. But this is so extraordinary because, um, you know, what really came across in the film is that number one, as you mentioned, that there is this massively punitive policy that happens in the United States that forces people to migrate or to, to unmigrate, as essentially. And, but then because they have these tremendous skills of speaking English, and as some folks in the film said, really understand the culture and not because they're reading about it, it's because they lived it for so many years, um, it makes them uh, perfect candidates for this. And it also raises this question of, you know, who do we think we're talking to when we, when we do these types of things? That's right. That's right. And I think, um, you know, the other part of it, I think that was so interesting that you mentioned is that everyone on my team that was on the ground, we had an incredible team, um, a local team of folks who are based in Tijuana, who are of the community, not the Deportu community, but they are Mexican and they are, and that was really important to us that we had folks on the ground who could kind of hold us accountable um, for and make sure, because even though we are, our team that that went over, you know, we are all from immigrant, we are from immigrant backgrounds, we are still, you know, we are not Mexican, and we nor and we are, I guess we are American, but, you know, the experience of, of being from that community, um, and having that representation on our team was really important to us. The but the, um, the interesting point is that everyone had worked in a call center, but me, and that actually really made that was also really important to me that I was had uh, folks on my team who could speak to that, who could empathize with that, who could, again, you know, really uh, relate to the perspective of, um, you know, of, of our, our participants, as we call them. The, the other thing though I, I wanted to say, which is, I mean, which is so exciting about talking to you around this is that obviously you're, you, that, you know, you have been doing so much work around immigration over the last number of years. And I'm just curious to hear if, you know, any of the things that we, any of the issues you saw represented in the, in the film, how that connected to the work that you've been doing at the Center for Constitutional Rights. I mean, that is, you know, obviously, you know far more about this than I. Yeah, well, I mean, thanks for that. And in fact, you know, what, this is the power of art and storytelling, because I think, you know, the Center for Constitutional Rights, we're litigators, we're advocates, and we generate like a metric ton of paper that says the same thing over and over again. And it lays out all the, the, the laws that the administration has violated. It raises all of the uh, questions of harm to people that are subject to these types of policies of deportation or even not being allowed into the country to seek asylum. But what we don't do and what we can't do in the in the court is what you've been able to do in this film, which is to be able to tell really clear stories or actually have your participants. And I love that you call them participants and not like characters or subjects. Um, but the, the, the people that are, whose stories are being lifted up, tell the most extraordinary piece. And, and it, I hear this all the time from the work that we do. And frankly, not even just in terms of immigration, but I think for anybody that's had this question of migration uh, sort of put to them and had to essentially forcefully adapt, which is you know, the way that I, after watching the film, I was thinking about forced adaptation. A number of the folks there talked about how we've had to adapt, how they've had to adapt to this situation. And they haven't lost sight of the fact that they know where home is for them. One of them, you know, talks very compellingly, not about where he, believe, he, he lives, but it's where he belongs. And he's now in a place where he doesn't belong. And, um, you know, in the work that we do at the Center for Constitutional Rights, we hear that constantly. And, you know, I also really like the, the, the film prompts me to really want to push anybody that's listening to get rid of the word immigration and to start thinking of the word migration. Because um, so many folks in this story talk about how their parents uh, brought them to the United States when they were, you know, 
children, some even newborns. And that's a migrant issue. And when we think about immigration, that's really a government frame. That's a government narrative of exclusion, that there are people that are supposed to be here, there are people that are not supposed to be here. And this film is filled with people that are supposed to be here and they are not. And what, I mean, what type of toll has that taken on you and the film team? And, and you know, what are the other pieces that folks were sharing with you that might not have made it into the film that are important? Sure, I think the only, really for the, the team, I, for myself and I think the rest of, of my, my team, I think when I, I can speak for us when I say that, honestly, it was an honor to make this film, like it, to be privy to the stories of these folks who were incredibly generous to us um, and and allowed us into their lives, into their homes, you know, into their their sort of joys and 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 their their struggles as well. Um, oftentimes, some of the things that I that I learned was how much for them of a stigma it is to be a, to be a deportee. Um, when particularly upon first arriving in Tijuana, you are seen. Um, often as someone who has done something terribly wrong, you know, perhaps you're a criminal. They, there is not, there is a, a lack of understanding, obviously, of the, again, as we mentioned, the punitive nature of the, the migration, right, the migration policies here. And they, so they, and oftentimes the, the locals uh, don't accept the, the deportees into the community. They see them as outsiders. They see them as troublesome. Um, so there is a, an exclusion from the culture. And then there's just an exclusion based on having, as you mentioned, been raised in the US for the, for most of these folks for the majority of their lives. So, um, and then they are, they're, they're essentially faced with uh, oftentimes being pulled between the cartels and then, you know, the, the cartels, the call centers, um, oftentimes the lure of substance abuse, which, you know, becomes an escape, right? Depression. And then there's the escape of substance abuse. And then interestingly, there's, there's the church, you know, there's uh, churches or like the one that's in the film that have sprung up religion to try to help fill that gap. Um, so again, uh, some, some, obviously there are some things are, of the some of the forces that pull at them are predatory others are incredibly well intentioned but there's just still they are they are caught in the middle of this vortex and and when we talk about i think one of the interesting things is we talk about family separation you know it's been a very hot topic with, and necessarily but when we talk about it at the border but i don't think people think about family separation when it comes to deportees in the same way. There is all, there is blame assigned to the deportees always. They are criminalized. And and then there is, uh, there but there is a ripple, an incredible, which I know you have seen, an incredible ripple effect, right, to what happens um, to not only it's, there's the deportee, but then there are their loved ones, their families, and then their communities. It ripples out to the communities. For example, I think about our, you know, two of the, the young women who are in the film, Alondra and Jenna, who are U.S. citizens, born, you know, in the U.S. So technically have, you know, every right to be here, but because Alondra's mother was deported, they ended up on the streets. You know, they didn't have, again, that, that lack of support. Alondra's grandmother was unable to take care of her and her siblings, and so, they end up homeless. I mean, so that just the, the, and what does that do to the community? What does that, you know, what is the greater impact of that? And the fact that these two young women left the U.S. to seek a better life uh, across the border really speaks to the failure of our, of our society. I mean, they are a future and we're not, you know, instead of taking care of them, supporting them, raising them up and make sure they achieve their dreams, you know, we are essentially crushing them. And I think that is, you know, one of the points I really wanted to make in the film was, is that it is not just an individual's issue. You know, you are, when you deport one person, essentially everyone around them pays the price. And we ultimately all pay the price. It, it's basically a crack in our society. And I, I but I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And if you feel like in, you know, in the work you've been doing as well, if you see that, if that sort of, larger impact. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's exactly what it is. And it, and it works the same way for um, 
punitive immigration rules as it does for punitive incarceration rules, mm -hmm. which is that, and, and, you know, that we live, you know, we have a punitive reflex in this country, which we've had for a very, very long time. It's not new, it's not gonna change with presidential administrations. This is actually something that can only really be recognized if people listen to the folks who have been criminalized. And you know, one of the big challenges of the current moment is, you know, we we're look at the next four years is not going to look like the last four years. We can definitely say that. But the problem is, is that the next four years might look like the four years before the last four years, which was not great. And in fact, uh, ushered in a lot of these um, horrible punitive policies around that that have the impact of of, se of family separation. And um, I really think that um, for people that are watching, it's, it's actually wonderful that the film has come out during this horrible, horrible COVID-19 global pandemic. And maybe not for, for film going audiences, but I think for people to tap into what it actually means to be isolated and to be separated, which we all are. I mean, there is not a person here who is watching who has not longed to be with family, that have not longed to be with other people, have not longed to be connected. Everybody now has missed birthdays. They've missed, some people have missed, well, people aren't necessarily getting married now, but they've certainly missed funerals, they've missed deaths because of a global pandemic. And this film raises the question of how does one adapt, not due to a natural disaster, but how does one adapt due to to governmental policy, which is essentially um, has the goal of separating families under the rubric of quote unquote safety and security. And when you watch the folks in this film, you ask yourself the question, for whose safety and security is this policy being enacted? Why are these people who have ties to communities that need their families to thrive, why are they missing births? Why are they missing weddings? Why are people that, you know, they talk about we're here and uh, the loved one is there. Why is there even a here and a there um, that keeps these families from, from being the types of entities in our society that actually make us grow? Why are they forced to adapt? Um, and we are not forced to shift our policy in the United States, which creates disastrous um, impacts on 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 folks. I you know I would say that what I've seen from the work we've had we have a number of of cases that connect to this. One case that we we had was a um, a case where we represented uh, a Honduran father and his son who um, had come across the border and were separated during um, you know put in cages separate cages in different states. Um, the son turned two while he was incarcerated in a different state from the father. I mean, it's the, and we went to court, we made a novel argument, which I think resonates in what the film talks about. And the argument that we made in court was that when you separate families, it under international human rights standard, it, it, uh, it rises to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. There's just no other way to look at it. And although none of the folks in, in your film invoke an international human rights legal standard, um, they are speaking very much to the pain and not just the gosh, I wish we were together, but the deep searing, soul wrenching pain of having to be forcibly removed from your family members and which essentially tears apart your family. And then everybody figures out, well, now what are we gonna do? And I'm hoping that folks that are suffering through this pandemic, and we were all sort of thinking, well, now what are we gonna do and how are we gonna adapt? Every time people say, well, the government should be doing more here or the government should be doing less here or the government rules don't make any sense, apply them to immigration, apply them to migration and tell me if those rules make any more sense based on what you're seeing in this film. Well, that's such a powerful analogy. It's, it's, it's so interesting, the idea. It's true that everyone right now is struggling with that, right? And if, if anyone, if, if, if there is anyone, you know, this is, as you said, the moment where we can all relate to the idea of family separation and what folks go through, you know, um, that's, that is, that was such a, that was so, so powerful and so, uh, so well said. I think the, I think, you know, one of the questions I have for you too, though, is you, you also invoked uh, mass incarceration, right? And there's been other really punitive policies with it. 
you know, that have existed, for example, there's the Muslim ban, right? Like obviously directed like very Islamophobic policies and then um, surveillance, right? Of, of also Muslim communities. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know you, and you mentioned that you feel like the, the next four years could possibly be worse, you know, or, or take us backwards. I'd love to hear, could you, could you talk a little bit about why? I'm just interested in, because it really, I think everyone is hoping for this to be, you know, this, the election to be sort of a game changer. And, and, you know, yet today we saw the, you know, I, I think it was just today, was it not that the, the hundred day moratorium on deportations was overturned by Judge Tipton. But um but I'm interested to hear your thoughts more about that. Um and from your standpoint. Yeah, the policies, you know, so the way that I look at it is this is that if anybody that's watching can think of a time when an election uh resulted in a sea change and uh freedom for all people that were oppressed, I would love to know. Uh, about that, going back to 1789, and no, Lincoln didn't free the slaves, just, you know, BTW. But it doesn't happen that way, and that's not the way that it works. And the thing that is actually more enduring um, is the American um, appetite for exceptionalism and the American appetite for criminalization. So, for example, um, there are, we are actually criminalized all of us, particularly people of color and um, um, folks who are uh, oppressed, we're criminalized for seeking our own freedom. So for example, if you were a slave um, in the 18 whatevers and you decided this is it, I'm out, you're leaving, you're criminalized because you're a fugitive. If you are someone who is come, looking to come to the United States for a better life, you're criminalized as a um, you know someone that's uh, illegal. And the no one has ever been able to seek this type of freedom against uh, the power of the United States without going through some measure of criminalization. And that's the challenge that the current administration, the Biden administration has over the next four years. And it's, a, it's gonna be a hard one for them because they have to really rethink the question of punishment and criminalization as they think about what the policies are moving forward. So it's not enough just to end the terrible, terrible, terrible things that Trump did and then reimpose a kinder, kinder and gentler version of what Obama did because you're still criminalizing communities. The idea of what a criminal alien is, that sells really, really, really well for people that aren't paying attention. But for the people that are criminalized, um, it, it, it not only limits their their chances in life, it actually determines in some way what their lives are gonna be like. And we can't be in a situation where we're saying these are the good folks, these are the folks that are not so much, we're gonna deport the folks that are not so much, and then end up thinking that we've solved the problem. We've actually just created a different one. So I think moving forward, it's really incumbent on all of us to push the Biden administration to reach the soaring uh, rhetoric and vision of uh, Amanda Gorman in her extraordinary poem that she did during the inauguration is that we are so much better than what our policies currently allow. And we're frankly so much better than what the politics of the day are gonna allow in terms of change, that it has to be a, a, a big push. And this is why I think art, creativity and storytelling is really important because it imagines us, allows us to go places uh, that the politics of the day say you're just never going to be able to do. Yeah, no, and I think, I mean, your your point about storytelling, but it, honestly, the stories oftentimes come from folks like you who are actually doing the work, you know, on the ground, like the, the stories, um, you know, that I feel like a lot of, so much of what I've worked on, you know, the, we are, again, we are just documenting, you know, the sort of the, the bravery of either, like, like I said, the participants in, in this film or, or folks like you who are actually change makers. And so, and I, it's, it's funny, I know that, that uh, it is, uh, I think, you know, there was a film series, if I'm, you know, I'd love to hear about that, that you had begun a number, you know, a couple of years ago, but I'd love to you talk about that and how you feel that intersection between, I guess, art and, you know, and, kind of, and sort of the work you do, you know, particularly when it comes to films that are obviously social justice based, you know, how that, how that uh, relationship 
plays out and what that was like. Yeah, um, and you know, so we have a film series at the Center for Constitutional Rights called Freedom Flicks, and we so you know we we show socially engaged documentaries, and we have discussions like awesome discussions like we're having, with you. <laughs> and um, but it really stems from this idea that if you have a lawyer, an activist, and a storyteller, you can change the world because there's only some. I mean, at some level, lawyers come in, and we're actually trying to use the mechanisms that are in place right now that are supposed to be protecting people to just highlight the fact that they are not and that they need to be changed. And the activists are the ones that put political pressure on the decision makers to say, look, you guys have to do the right thing. The storytellers are the ones that blow minds. Because I mean, look, you're, you, you, make, your, you make your film, you told the story, uh, lifted up the story of, of folks that were there, no question about it. But another thing that you also did was, for people that have watched this film, they have seen something that most people never get a chance to see. Not everybody, but most people never get a chance to see the answer to that question. What the heck does happen when people um, end up being sent, not even necessarily sent back, but being sent away? How do they land? What do they do? And the, you know, as you mentioned, the idea that there is a capital niche for people who are deported that speak English so that we can actually pull these folks in and make a lot of money because they've got a set of skills um, that it's really hard to find over here. And it's one of those crazy things where um, it's, it's extractive. People, people grow up being, you know, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the United States, they get sent back. And then all of a sudden, these companies are extracting their skills and saying, we can make a whole lot of money off of this. And then the people in the United States are calling and are, and they're assuming that they're talking to um, somebody that they went to high school with, which they might be. But the people on the other side of that phone at the call centers are only longing, only longing to be back in that space with their families that they've known all of their lives. And it's it's powerful. So yeah, um, lawyers are important, activists super important. Storytellers though. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's funny. I feel like we as storytellers have the reverse feeling about both activists and lawyers. But the, um, you know, it's so interesting that you say the, about the community, you know, to you down there, one of the things that I think was really amazing to me is also how resilient, how incredibly resilient um, folks are, you know what I mean? Like building community, building, you know, again, building life out of, you know, essentially out of what uh, might be ashes, you know, and, and like, you know, after everything you know is kind of burned to the ground. The, um, you know, I have like both Danny and Robotico, who are two of, you know, again, our participants, you know, they have families, at least, well, the, uh, Danny has a family, Roberto has a partner, you know, and, you know, a whole life that he's created there, again, as, as sort of an, as an activist, he works in the call centers, but he's also an activist for deported veterans. And um, that, to me, that was something, you know, again, um, witnessing what the veterans who had been deported had to their experience to me was incredibly um, moving and, and painful because again, to have served the country, you know, and sort of um, to have risked your life and to, to have done, you know, kind of, again, gone that far, you know, in your patriotism and then to be, um, to be deported was, was really shocking. So, but I think that, uh, I also, I have to say, it's it's incredible how, they, you know, and then again, the call centers are there to exploit, but then you have someone like Danny who is trying to create a call center specifically where he employs deportees who have the same experience as him and he can relate to them. So, and then and then there was also, I found among the, the deportees an incredible amount of empathy and support for migrants who were coming north and, and being criminalized by the Trump administration at that time. You know, they were being referred to as the migrant caravan, et cetera, and, you know, as criminals. And, you know, there was nonsense about uh, the fact that, 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 you know, extremists, Muslim extremists were with them as well. If you were, I think we all remember that fiasco. But the, um, you know, the incredible sort of outpouring of support from, from 
both the folks in Tijuana and then the um, the deported community in particular was really powerful to see. So that's something too. I I really want to to just make sure that you know to take note of that again the you know despite the the circumstances they uh, the the ability to rebuild and not just rebuild, but then to empower others, you know, is something that I witnessed. And, and, and that was also beautiful and unexpected. And I hope people can also learn from that, you know, that, that the folks who are being deported are, again, I think on this side, they're so, they're criminalized, as you said, but to see them on the other side, it was important for us to show that, you know, to show a different lens, if I may. So I think that's exactly right. We, um, uh, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, we have a case called East Bay Sanctuary versus Barr. And just recently, uh, the court ruled again for the third time that <laughs> the Trump administration's uh, attempts to remove the possibility of seeking asylum for people that came to the United States through third countries, uh, you know, barred, barred that from, from being uh, applied. <clears throat> and what's, what's bananas about the whole thing is, frankly, that you know the last four years has been really crappy immigration policy on steroids and so it is great um that we can defeat the last gasps of the trump administration and their their cruelty and dishonesty through the courts but we are still faced with the question um that was plaguing us and that you know and it was a moral question as well as a legal question before that man ever got elected which is how on earth can we be treating our people this way. And by our people, I'm not putting a uh, nationalistic frame around that. I mean, our people, the people that are migrating here or people that have migrated here um, to both better themselves and to make us better. How could we possibly treat them this way? And what does that say about us? And so I'm really hoping that the film uh, encourages people's instincts to engage in this question. The worst thing that people can do is to say, oh, Biden's here, Kamala Harris is here, this stuff is gonna be fixed, we're gonna move on. We cannot move forward and we cannot move forward as a country, as a people, as human beings until each one of us um, has the dignity and respect that they deserve and we, and we refuse, we reject criminalized nar narratives about entire communities that just make everything worse. So that's what I I, that's what I, I, I I couldn't I couldn't like echo that more. I mean that was that was again that's I think you're 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 absolutely right. We can't be complacent. You know, we can't sleep as as you know, as folks said, right? You it's like there's no um there's so much work to there's so much terrible policy and to undo and so many narratives to shift. And I think, you know, as storytellers, our job is to to try to help shift the narrative, right? So that um, so again, and always to show a different perspective, and and uh, and I think for yeah you know, for us as documentary filmmakers too, interestingly, there's been a, a lot of struggle um, around sort of decolonizing to our I think ourselves internally, you know, our, our own minds and our practices um, to to make sure that we too are are moving forward in a, with a values-based approach to filmmaking because to everything we do is is steeped in these sort of again the the fabric of our society has always been as you said these sort of punitive measures toward immigration but also towards so many right there's towards so many uh, communities like you know white supremacy anti-blackness homophobia xenophobia etc it's just there's so there's so much undoing um that needs to happen and i think uh one of the things that has been really um meaningful to me is to work with in partnership with folks like multitude films who produced uh who produced my film who have the same values aligned also topic stories has been incredible and then my my own team you know was sort of we, we made sure uh, to partner with folks um who who similarly again have the same similar values? My uh, Asad Faruqi, who is my my DP and kind of like a brother, he's basically a brother to me as well. But is from Pakistan, you know, and um, and he and and you know again 
was grew up when the war on terror was was sort of was happening over there, you know, as pushed post 9-11. So he was on the opposite side. And so it has an incredible insight into, you know, into these perspectives. And my editor, Viri Deanna Lieberman, um, again, just has someone who has a really sensitive perspective on uh, folks who are often marginalized and, um, and excluded. And then my team on the ground, uh, which is Abraham Avila, was my producer on the ground in Tijuana. And he actually said to me at one point, because I think the words actually came out of my mouth where I said, reverse migration. And he, he, and he looked at me and said, like I said, some, we were talking about people, the young women in the film who left uh, the U.S. and we, I referred to it as reverse migration. And he said, "When well, he said, what are you talking about? There's no reverse migration. Migration is migration. You know what I mean? It may be forced, you know, maybe, but exactly, maybe involuntary. But there is no reverse migration. And it's and and similarly, the lesson like that in the film, there is that young a young man, and and you might have seen right at the end, we have we have him quoted, but he. He, you know, he talks about the fact that borders are just man-made. You know, borders are this man-made, uh, this man-made thing, and that that you know, I mean, of course, you know, he says it from a religious perspective, but that he says that you know, but it was never they were never intended by God to exist, and I think that to me, coming from someone who you know had just again, I believe he had literally traveled from Venezuela up, you know, to to where, to Mexico, uh, seeking a better life. And then was, you know, again, was being labeled as part of the migrant caravan. Um, that's sort of the, the, the forgiveness with which he, he, in the film, he speaks about the president, you know, and says, I hope that, you know, the only thing I have to say about him, this was Trump at the time, President Trump was set with, you know, and all his horrendous policies, he, you know, he says, he said, you know, may God bless him and maybe one day he will regret, you know, everything that he's done. And that's, I mean, I, those words would never come from me or couldn't have come from me, you know, but to, but to see, again, that sort of perspective and kind of uh, wisdom and resiliency is, um, is I think also really, was really, uh, again, for me, really powerful and uh, really an honor to witness. So, and I'm sure for you, the and when I think about, you know, the stories that you, again, every everything t for filmmakers or a filmmaker like me, I imagine everything you work on is a story. You know, that's, you are also, you know, you are immersed in that. So um, I imagine is it's what keeps you going. Yeah, I think it, it actually does because the, the stories are, so powerful, the visions are so clear, the resilience is so strong that you, in, in the face of just crushing cruelty, that you can't help, you, you say to yourself, well, who am I to just like, you know, just go watch Netflix and pretend this is not happening. Like I cannot disengage because I stay connected to the stories that people are telling me. I think about them at night. I think about them as we're thinking about what our strategies are as we're going into court, as we're doing a congressional hearing, writing a report, um, because th these things just don't undo themselves and they stay done until we, we address them. I uh, just, you know, a, a note about um, Trump, um, and 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 possibility that the folks, the, the probably the thing that you don't want in your life is for someone to say that the best thing you could possibly ever do is to regret what you've done. <laughs> like that's just not a good look. It's not a good place to be. But you know what I'm the folks that I am really privileged to see and work with with my team at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and I think some of the seems like some of the folks in in the story they actually have a very different view of the future because at some level um you know there's a difference between hope and optimism and uh those of us who feel that things work for us can be really optimistic about it so it's like oh you know what? i'm driving down the road i'm getting pulled over uh, i'm sorry i'm driving down the road and my car is broken down on the highway and here comes a police car for those people who are white and for those people where cops work in their favor they're like thank god the cops are coming because i'm going to get on the road that's optimism because i think it's going to work out for many of others of us people that look like me you you get stuck on a road and you see a cop car you're hoping that this thing turns out well, but you're not necessarily feeling optimistic about it. Yeah. And the folks, 
that are subject to these types of cruelties, the folks um, in your film, at least you know, from my perspective of what I was seeing, is that they hold out a very, very powerful sense of hope. And they can't say that this is gonna change. They can't say that this is gonna be made right, but at some level they hope. Um, as in the in the most powerful way that enslaved people did, in the most powerful way um, that indigenous communities that have been decimated still do, that we as a society, as a collective, as a polity, will come to realize, my God, what have we done? And that will only happen if we listen to the voices like the ones in your mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's a bit of pleasure. Um, Thank you so much. I want to tell uh, folks, please, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to see it, you should definitely watch uh, Call Center Blues. It is a powerful, sh short film that will have you thinking for much, much, much longer than its runtime. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Geeta. I'm a huge fan. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's honestly, it's, it's, uh, I am a huge fan, so we can, uh, but we can have a competition over that. <laughs> we can have a competition over that later, for sure. Um, but thank you so much for your time. It means everything. That's a, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for the film.